I assume the yellow cloud has one on their face. When, well, hi. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to get to come and demonstrate all the things I've broken my fingers over for the years. I'm going to turn a little hollow form, and the basics for doing a hollow form are the same whether it's this big or this big. The first, there are a couple ways to mount it to the lathe that you have to be aware of. I prefer to mount it with a tenon. A lot of people prefer faceplate and screws. They say that's safer, but you know, you do what you get used to. When you've done it a lot of times, you're going to stick with what you know. And I'm not going to tell you one's better than the other because I haven't done faceplate turning in a long time. <laughs> when I finally got that first chuck that was $270. <laughs> I said, you're going to use this, <laughs> and you're going to keep on using it. 270 bucks is a lot of money. Um, and I try to tell a funny joke or story in the beginning. So, uh, you know, we're talking about forgetfulness, which is something we all are afflicted with. Two old fellows have been playing chess together in the park for 40 years together. And one of them looks at the other fellow, and he says, you know, I know you. We're really good friends. But he said, I just can't think of your name. The other fellow looked at him and he said, can I get back to you on that? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is fun, and we're supposed to laugh and have a good time. I hope I don't give you anything too much to laugh about. Um, for the new fella, when you turn a tenon, make sure that you get a nice, clean, crisp tenon, so that... Right yeah, where am I looking? Oh, Same place I do at all the other clubs. Uh, because you guys are so nice to have this one down here. So you've got a 90 degree here. That way when it goes into the edge of the chuck, it doesn't tip this way. So with your first tenons, make sure they're nice, clean, good, crisp cuts. And then you can take it in and out of whatever jaws you need to, and it'll always go back in and run pretty close to true. Not exactly, but pretty close. So that's your first turning lesson. And this is Bradford Pear as well. And the reason I use Bradford Pear is because it's very tight grain and it takes an even texture, but it turns really smooth. First thing we're going to do is kind of define the outside shape. See, see what I meant about the tenon? I took it in and out. I cut a clean tenon. It's not really bouncing around. If I ran my tool on here, it's not bumping up and down. It's still fairly true. And the first thing you always do is make sure you're back to round. And then if you're really silly, you'll push it off and hit your chuck. None of us has ever done that, have we? And since you're going to be hollowing, on a small piece you can pretty much define the entire shape and go down fairly thin on the bottom. You don't have to go all the way with it. But you want to leave a little meat there to stop any kind of vibration as you're going through on hollowing. And I guess I really should put on a pair of safety glasses. And I might be able to see with all the dust on them. I don't know about you guys, but I have been wearing dust masks constantly for the last couple of weeks. I wasn't too bad with the wood dust, but when you added the pollen in, I was like, oh my gosh, let me get some Zyrtec. Walmart sells a generic for about half the price. Now that we're almost past that. Yeah, I've been wearing those little surgical masks, you know, they're easier. And you can change them out in the day. Every time you sneeze, you get a new one. <laughs> Uh, and I went to Walmart the other day, and when I did, I said, you know, I need some of those little surgical masks you guys have got. And he said, ma'am, we have sold out. Because if you look around, everybody's out cutting their grass, and the yellow cloud has one on their face. When, when you do a hollow form, when you have not done them very much in the beginning, Give yourself a rounder top because you've got to go in there and clean that surface out. As you get better with doing it, you can make a more severe cut because you've got to get a really steep angle to get in there and clean it out. 
but start with a little more rounded so you can get inside there and clean that shoulder. That makes sense, right? Sometimes I scare myself. Come on guys, smile. Like I said, this is supposed to be fun. I looked all around my shop this afternoon and I said, I've got to come up with some wood. And I went out to the wood pile, you know, it's that time of year where your little friends like to slither. And before I went out, I turned around and got my hoe. <laughs> my friend is in Blairsville and she said, she, we grew up together in, in believe it or not, East Point. And she uh, said that she had gone out cleaning and weeding and stuff and had moved a mat or something that was on the back porch down at the bottom and about six or eight copperheads slithered out that were like eight or nine inches long. And I said, I don't know about you, but the lesson I learned was my papa always taught me to take a hoe to the yard this time of year and not be too far away from your hoe because you might need it. I did last year a couple of times. Uh, you know, it's against the law in Georgia to kill a non-poisonous snake. I don't know if you knew that. I say they're all poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you feel threatened, right? Right. You know, he, I, I couldn't tell what he looked like. I, he was bloody by the time I got through with him. <laughs> he was bait. We had little pieces. We were going to scoop him up and go fishing. <laughs> okay, so that's basically your shape. And the thing we do when we're new turners is we'll look at this and we'll stop right about there and say that's just about tall enough, isn't it? Because you're not used to looking at it sideways. Your mind tells you that that's long enough there when it really isn't. It won't look right. So you have to just kind of tighten up your little arm and say let's go just a little further with that. And that's still thick because it's going to be hollow. But in the end I'm going to taper that down a little bit more. Well, that was kind of noisy. Dave, why did that picture reverse? <laughs> yeah. It's like you were standing behind the lane. Oh. oh, scary, isn't it? Yeah, see, now I can see from that. That is a little odd. Okay, so now that it's been in the chuck for a little while, safety tip. You know the fibers compress as they've been tightened. You, that's cost you five bucks. Man, <laughs> price is going up. <laughs> At the AAW Symposium, they'll give you a really hard time, so just bear that in mind. Tighten it just a little bit more because it's going to be out there free spinning while you hollow it. It's got a little piece there, and I'm going to take the big tool that's off because I like the little one better. And I did clean it up a little bit, so it should smooth, move a little smoother. I have this bit. It was also lost like the turning jacket. It still is. <laughs> All right, what would you do with it? This is Michael um, Hare's nice chuck that I bought probably when he first got them eight or ten years ago. Put, put Put solos at a meeting, my gosh, I sold 30 of them. I bet, and you know what, it, it really has been a, a pretty good $40 investment. I was like, I bought another one from him just so I'd have it, just because he said he wasn't going to sell them anymore. I said, darn, Michael, I might need that. I only have about five or six. I can't afford that many. you got more money than I do. One thing you want to do when you're going to do a Forstner bit, give it a place to go to. Feel that little bit of vibration? Or hear it? That's because it's out over the edge a little bit too much. A little longer than it should really have a support out here. Now, the most important thing is to give yourself that little recess, a little track spot, because you've got this little point guy here, and if you've got a piece sticking up, it's going to track around the outside edge of that. So make sure you got the point for it to follow in. Second thing you have to do, and this works for all hollow forms, big and small, 
make sure you know how far you have to go with that Forstner bit because there's a short distance between funnel and hollow form. <laughs> and if you want to get really precise, you can measure when you bring a tape when you bring a measure. If not, you can just find something to measure with. This kind of looks good right about there. We're going to go a little bit further. But on a little hollow form, give yourself some weight in the bottom. I know the big deal is to clean it out as far as you can. But when you use a small foot on the bottom of that, it tips really easily if it's very, if it's very lightweight at the bottom. So give yourself just a little bit of weight still and leave some wood in there. You don't have to go like this, but say half an inch. It just keeps it upright. You know, there's nothing worse than working really hard on a piece and then losing it because somebody knocks it off accidentally. Did you see that really precise measurement I just did? <laughs> That's what that tape's for. And when I don't have that, I keep a Sharpie marker, and then I just take a piece of sandpaper <laughs> and mark off my last mark so that I don't go for the same one twice. It looks like you've got three to choose from. I do. That's the last two I did. See over there? <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to move this because it's going to stop me. All right, see, we went into the little hole. <coughs> and it's running smoothly. If we didn't do that little hole, we'd be jumping all over the place. And these guys get hot. And they smell and they squeak. And when you start seeing shavings building on the upper side of it, is when you want to pull it out and free it. And I do it twice. Here, fussing at me. And I ha at home I have a candle. I keep an old birthday candle. And I just touch it because it gets hot enough to melt it and it keeps going. But, if, but what happens is, if you don't pull that out and clear it, you end up with an art piece that has metal in it. Because that bit will stick in there. Especially on cherry. Of course, I have several of those modern art pieces with <laughs> Forstner bits now. You know, you'll do everything you can think of. And finally, you just have to get a chisel and break it open and get your bit back. Because you can get more wood. This needs some grease. <laughs> Whoa, that one went a little further than the Powermatic one goes. Okay, we're getting close. So you like that, see, it was not that political. <laughs> fun is fun. You know, we make fun of everything. They have an app on uh, your cell phone now where you can make yourself look like somebody. My daughter came in there with a picture of herself of Donald Trump's hair. I said, please don't. Please don't. Of all things, not the hair. All right, we're down there. And we've compensated for the little point. So you see, we're right at the top edge, so we're down where we're supposed to be. I guess I should have pulled that out before I turned it off. Huh? There we go. Now we get to pull it out of here. Now, on a bigger piece, I have a couple of different hollowing systems I use. Um, I have one of the first elbow tools that they sold at Highland, and I like that. It mounts to the spindle on the tailstock, which can be an issue because it can tip. Um, if you get a catch, it'll sling. So you do have to be aware and keep that really tight. The newer ones have a different hookup, so they're, but you know, 250 bucks is 250 bucks, and the new one's like 300 and over. I also have the Lyle Jamison system, and I like Lyle, but I hate his turning system. It had a laser, and that laser would vibrate, and you would set it with your cutter for your depth inside your piece, and as you started turning wood, that laser would vibrate loose. And the next thing you know, you're right through your piece. So I finally took the laser off and learned to listen and measure. 
and and you know everybody's got these great little camera guys they're doing. Now you're wondering what the little compressor is for. When this loads up with shaving, it quits cutting, or it'll start going. Ch -ch 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 -ch. As the guy says, that's your sign. So you're getting a lot of shavings. I'm still able to pull them out because I don't have a really deep cut yet. But once that cut gets a little deeper, and it gets filled up a little bit more. Thank you. I gave this poor compressor to Nick Agar at our symposium last year. And somehow it got bumped and all the moving around and a little fitting was loose inside. And every time he tried to use it, it lost its pressure. <laughs> so he fought with that poor compressor the whole time. And I said, I'm so sorry, Nick. It worked fine before I brought it here. I just use it like in my little artist area to blow the counter off and stuff. I don't really use it in my shop. I have another compressor in my shop, but it's too big to carry around. Oh, does it? Well, gee. <laughs> I thought I'd give it to him at the regular symposium. What edge are you using to cut? You know, this, I know you can't see. This is a, a really thick fluted gouge, and if Harvey Meyer was here, he could tell me whose tool this was. Alan Lacer? Is this an. Is that Alan? Mate, it's a it's a it's a glazer tool, but the but the tool itself was a fellow who doesn't we don't see him anymore. He's they made a set of these that were signature gouges of his, and you see how shallow the flute is on this. So this is almost like a scraper, but I'm cutting right on this edge at like a 45. It's floating in the air inside there. You're cutting on the bottom edge. Yeah, I'm cutting on the bottom edge, not the top. Okay. So when I go in, that's the bottom edge cutting. And then it's cutting on the nose of it on the left side. And that, that straight, the straight grind on it like this. When I do this, I have the diamond wheels at home, so I set the angle on the on the flat plate, that's okay. You see how it's ground? I put it on the flat plate like this on the grinder, and I do this, and then I turn it on and do that. And it's on the diamond wheel, so it doesn't take very much meat of this off. And, and these are Jerry Glazer tools. I've had them for a long time. Uh, I got them from Allison Taylor when John Taylor passed away in his estate sale. And he had bought the whole set. We were all laughing because Joe Geddes had bought a thousand dollars worth of tools, and then he had to go back and buy another thousand. You know, I was like, "Well, gosh, Joe, <laughs> I had two dollars." <laughs> you know? But um, I've actually had some of these replaced. I've got a buddy who's a machinist, and he made me a holder because Jerry Glazer came up with this design where at the very bottom, see that shoulder? There's a pin in the tool handle right there. And that shoulder goes in and catches at that pin. Now it's got so much, it's such a good fit. This isn't spring loaded, this is air. It fits so good that it won't let the air escape. And they're loaded with lead shot and you can put in more or less from the other end um, it's not easy. You have to pop that out and have it pressed back in is what I understand. I don't, I haven't ever done it. I left that one alone. The ones that I got at Highland that were going to be the new Jerry Glazer replacements, um, you know, I was all excited. I thought, man, now I'm going to get the rest of the tools I want. And then they didn't ever really come to fruition. You know, they, the guy talked about it. He had a big display at one of the symposiums. And it, there was a lot of dog and pony shows, but the horse never did leave the barn. <laughs> and
and he wanted $180 for each tool just about, and 200 or better for some of them. And that's when Tug got mad and he started making tools. So we're taking this out a little at a time. And this is what you're going to do. You're going to go down to the bottom center where, where that Forstner bit went in and catch it and pull it back. And that's where you'll get a catch if you're not careful. Because my tool's gotten dull. And there's a diamond sharpener over here, isn't there? It doesn't have a tool rest on it yet. Well, what do you got? What? Oh, I got a home. That's all right. I'll just hone it a little since you don't have it really set up yet. You can plug it in? You sure? Okay. We're going to take this off and go over here. Step back. Boy, that one just sings, doesn't it? Now see, that doesn't take much. But this is very solid and very sturdy, and that's why you can do these smaller guys with that without having to go through all that hooking up all the other stuff. I, I started to do all that, and I said, we don't have that much time to show you all the cutters, and you really do need to have the different cutters and how you sharpen them explained to you on, on, the, on the system. So every one is just a little different. And it's a matter of practice. Now I gotta clean it out again. So when you're new to this, Holy. Measure and see where you are. This gives you the di the thickness on on this end. Will give you the thickness. So you just check down to see how far you are. So you're pretty consistent all the way up at about three quarters of an inch. And you just nibble away at it until you get it cleaned out. And the catches are a little more dramatic when you're faster. But for me, it's not, because I turn fast most of the time. I like to turn it a little bit faster than that. But see, so you end up with a whole lot of trash in there real quick. Maybe that, well, you know, I did take Stewart's classes when he was here. He, he was so much fun. We, a long time ago, Redmond and Son in, um, at Fulton Industrial, when they were at Fulton Industrial, a whole group of us went there every time we got the opportunity to take the class. When this was a little longer, it was a little easier. Now hear that sound right there, that's shavings. It's pulling shavings out of the way. It's not getting any meat there. See, all the shavings goop up. And the place that you get to is called the sweet spot that you go through the outside edge is that angle right there. That's where it likes to cut the best. And that's where you'll stay as a new turner who hasn't done a lot of hollowing work. You'll get on that little sweet spot. And you'll say, hmm, that feels good. It's cutting really great. And the next thing you know, you see, the first thing you see before you hear it is a little bit of sawdust where one little edge has come through. And then you see that you have two new pieces instead of the one that you thought you had. You know, there aren't any mistakes in wood turning that I have not made once and gone back the second time to verify. <laughs> You know, isn't that the way it is? I'm like, what did I do wrong? 
let me see if I can do that again. <laughs> you know, used to, I see I keep a band-aid. I looked down yesterday and I was bleeding and I was like, what did you do? I hadn't touched anything, there was no tool near me. I said, so my joke was, used to when I came to a demonstration, the first one I ever did, the first time I ever demonstrated, probably eight or nine years ago, I cut myself and I didn't want anybody to know. And I was trying to kind of be nonchalant and, and cover it up with a paper towel and I was bleeding like a stuck pig. Of course I was. You know, and everything I touched had my blood on it. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So the second time, I put a Band-Aid in my toolbox. And, and since I did that one yesterday, I said, you know, you're just bound to cut yourself tonight. <laughs> so this is still pretty thick. I still have those finger braces, however, in the first aid cabinet. The aluminum ones, you know? Look, his, see, he's hurt his finger twice, too. You know those aluminum things you wear for six weeks while the joint heals? You know, because you said, I can sand that with my hand in that bowl. <laughs> I know I can do that. And about that time, it goes, flip. <laughs> and you say bad words. She's kind of the youngest one, but... She's not the smallest. We eat good at my house. My daughter's from Guatemala. And uh, Guatemalan people are generally, this is just a, a, a side note, they're small. When I was in Guatemala, I have never been able to see over a crowd. You know, I'm like, I'm always the one looking at the tall people. And I'm in Guatemala in the streets. And everybody's like to right here, and I could see everything. <laughs> I thought, wow, this is a whole new perspective on life. <laughs> and, and I thought she would be short, but the pediatrician says she's going to be probably five, six, or seven, which is really tall for Guatemalan people. And the number one stupid question when I brought her home was, what language did she speak? And I said, well, what language did your child speak at five and a half months? <laughs> Can you, you know, people are sometimes... <laughs> Einstein said, at least genius can be measured. <laughs> there is no accounting for stupidity. <laughs> All right, so still got a little bit in the shoulder up here. And I'll have to show you. So, see, we're down to about three-eighths. When you say, Jack, about three-eighths? About safe thickness. Safe thickness? Yeah, we can, we can do a little more, but... <clears throat> Stop there? Oh, come on. Life's not fun until you try to make the same mistake twice. I knew it's You can really hear it. One guy used to have a... One guy came one time and he had a car halogen light bulb and he and he put it in there on the end of the cutter and you could see the halogen light start coming through as he was turning and I thought oh boy <laughs> this has not been po <laughs> maybe I should move back two or three rows but you know that guy got it all turned out and he didn't blow it up and you can almost read the newspaper through that vessel and I was like but why would you want to do that I've done it but you gotta have well, yeah, you know, this is dry. This is good and dry. Okay, that's good enough for y'all. <laughs> no. I think I do need a little bit more out of there. It's not good enough for me. i got to keep on. And I do have one of the little lights, Jack. I've got one of the little, you know, AAA battery guys. No, I think i got mine at Home Depot. You know that checkout line, it's murder, isn't it? <laughs> I can go and buy one thing and get to the checkout line and then my, I have to pull out my American Distress card. I'm like, why did you leave that here? <laughs> why did you put that right where I could see it and know that I needed it? And there I am, you know? We're going to get a little more out of the bottom there. Because it is thick. It's, thick. it's thick down in there and that edge is just finally gone on that corner right there. I like to do that because it's aggravating as hell to have to listen to. Isn't it? My car has got a backup beeper. You know, 
and it gets it gets nervous. When you start backing up, it sees the garbage can, it goes beep. And then it thinks that garbage can got really big really quick and it's going beep, 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 beep. And before you know it, it's going, nah! <laughs> and I see the garbage can move just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs>